Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous day. Gorgeous day. Here in the end times in paradise, in the middle of God knows where, in Big, Bigfoot Alley, in the East Cascades of Washington State here on this spectacularly gorgeous Monday evening, August 14, 2017. And guys, I know that I promise you that I am done boring you with uh, selections from what is quickly becoming to be my newest favorite book of all times, which I am just punching myself for never reading before. Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, this banned book, banned book from uh, that 1934, I believe, when, uh, when Henry Miller, this dude, he sat down in 1934 and spelled it out. He fucking laid it out for any clueless fucking moron on this planet who did not get it did not get it how this planet, uh, how this uh, shit storm was brewing uh, in 1934, laying it out. And uh, so I'm sitting here, I don't have any fucking internet to read whatever the, the, the latest uh, little fucking hate mail in, in my own mailbox about what a fucking alcoholic, clueless moron, racist whatever I am. I don't have any internet to find out if, if Donald Trump is sucking Kim Jong-un's dick or what, and I don't give a fuck because fuck it all, you guys. It's right here in Tropic of Cancer. And so if I, if I promised you that I wasn't gonna bore you with any more readings, well, once again, I lied because I'm a fucking liar, okay? I'm gonna have to have a rant about what fucking Humpty Dumpty tribe is, all right? Because apparently, you just don't get it. What the hell I'm trying to do here, people? I'm trying to pull your fucking head out of your ass. That's what I'm trying to do. It's the same thing that Henry Miller was trying to do in 1934. And, and, and dealing with these fucking clueless morons banning his book. It had nothing to do with him using the word cunt. Nothing to do with it. This was one of the most subversive books ever written. Going up against these motherfuckers. Telling them where they could fucking stick their shit. Where, where they could cram it up their fucking asses. So anyway, I, I, I am getting very depressed that I am uh, winding up this book, and, 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 and how does this man do it? <coughs> so this, I believe, is the second to the last chapter, and I'm not promising you I ain't coming back with more readings from this, because this is my show. I do whatever the fuck I want. I eat dessert first here at Humpty Dumpty Tribe because I am God of the Internet and you are my little cultist. Take it away, Henry. 1934. <clears throat> so where they are, this is uh, uh, Henry and his buddy Fillmore uh, on a Sunday morning after some, after going on some drunk the night before, stumbling around on a on a Sunday morning, trying to find their way back home. <clears throat> okay. About dawn, it began to snow. We walked about from one quarter to another, taking a last look at Paris. Passing through the Rue de Saint Dominique, we suddenly fell upon a little square, and there was the Eglise. Saint Clotilde. People were going to mass. Fillmore, whose head was still a little cloudy from the night before, was bent on going to mass too, for the fun of it, as he put it. 
I felt somewhat uneasy about it. In the first place, I had never attended a mass, and in the second place, I looked seedy, and I felt seedy. Fillmore, too, looked rather battered, even more disreputable than myself. His big slouch hat was on assaways, and his overcoat was still full of sawdust from the last joint we had been in. However, we marched on in. The worst they could do would be to throw us out. I was so astounded by the sight that greeted my eyes that I lost all my uneasiness. It took me a little while to get adjusted to the dim light. I stumbled around behind Fillmore holding his sleeve. A weird, unearthly noise assailed my ears. A sort of hollowing drone that rose up out of the cold flagging. A huge, dismal tomb it was with mourners shuffling in and out. A sort of antechamber to the world below. Temperature about 55 or 60 Fahrenheit. No music except this undefinable dirge manufactured in the subcellar. Like a million heads of cauliflower wailing in the dark. <laughs> a million heads of cauliflower wailing in the dark. Uh, <laughs> the guy is a genius. Uh, anyway, where were we? Uh, <laughs> uh, people in shrouds were chewing away with that hopeless, dejected look of beggars who hold out their hands in a trance and mumble an unintelligible appeal. That this sort of thing existed, I knew, but then one also knows that there are slaughterhouses and morgues and dissecting rooms. One instinctively avoids such places. In the street, I had often passed a priest with a little prayer book in his hands, laboriously memorizing his lines. Idiot, I would say to myself, and let it go at that. In the street, one meets with all forms of dementia, and the priest is by no means the most striking. Two thousand years of it has deadened us to the idiocy of it all. However, when you are suddenly transported to the very midst of his realm, when you see the little world in which the priest functions like an alarm clock, you are apt to have entirely different sensations. For a moment, all this slaver and twitching of the lips almost began to have a meaning. Something was going on, some kind of dumb show, which, not rendering me wholly stupefied, held me spellbound. All over this world, wherever there are these dim-lit tombs, you have this incredible spectacle. The same mean temperature, the same crepuscular glow, the same buzz and drone. All over Christendom, at certain stipulated hours, people in black are groveling before the altar where the priest stands up with a little book in one hand and a dinner bell or atomizer in the other and mumbles to them in a language which, even if it were comprehensible, no longer contains a shred of meaning. Blessing them, most likely. Blessing the country. Blessing the ruler. Blessing the firearms and the battleships and the ammunition and the hand grenades. Surrounding him on the altar are little boys dressed like angels of the Lord who sing alto and soprano, innocent lambs, all in skirts, 
sexless, like the priest himself, who is usually flat-footed and nearsighted to boot, a fine, epicene, caterwauling, sex in a jockstrap to the tune of J. Maul. Unfortunately, I do not know who J. Maul is. Could someone educate me, please? I was taking it, and I, I need to get back and take a swig of my, uh, your old pothead alcoholic needs a swig of his margarita here. I was taking it in as best I could in the dim light, fascinating and stupefying at the same time. All over the civilized world, I thought to myself, all over the world. Marvelous! Rain or shine, hail, sleet, snow, thunder, lightning, war, famine, pestilence makes not the slightest difference. Always the same mean temperature, the same mumbo jumbo. Here comes the, uh, the choppers. I love having an, a, a, a uh, a Henry Miller reading interrupted by a uh, <laughs> by a firefighting helicopter. <laughs> Guys, I, 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 I could not have scripted this uh, this life for myself. Couldn't have done it. Okay, where where was I before the chopper came flying over? <clears throat> Always the same mean temperature, the same mumbo-jumbo, the same high-laced shoes, and the little angels of the Lord singing soprano and alto. Near the exit, a little slot box to carry on the heavenly work so that God's blessing may rain down upon king and country and battleships and high explosives and tanks and airplanes so that the worker may have more strength in his arms, strength to slaughter horses and cows and sheep, strength to punch holes in iron girders, strength to sew buttons on other people's pants, strength to sell carrots in sewing machines and automobiles, strength to exterminate insects and clean stables and unload garbage cans and scrub lavatories, strength to write headlines and chop tickets in the subway, strength, strength, all that lip chewing and horn swoggling just to furnish a little strength. Yes, this is me furnishing a little strength for this ramp. We were moving about from one spot to another, surveying the scene with that clear-headedness which comes after an all-night drunk. We must have made ourselves pretty conspicuous shuffling about that way with our coat collars turned up and never once crossing ourselves and never once moving our lips except to whisper some callous remark. Perhaps everything would have passed off without notice if Fillmore had not insisted on walking past the altar in the midst of the ceremony. He was looking for the exit and he thought while he was at it, I suppose, that he would take a good squint at the Holy of Holies get a close-up on it, as it were. We had gotten safely by and were marching toward a crack of light, which must have been the way out, when a priest suddenly stepped out of the gloom and blocked our path. He wanted to know where we were going and what we were doing. We told him politely enough that we were looking for the exit. We said the English word exit because at the moment we were so flabbergasted that we couldn't think of the French word for exit. Without a word of response, he took us firmly by the arm and opening the door, a side door it was, 
he gave us a push and out we tumbled into the blinding light of day. It happened so suddenly and unexpectedly that when we hit the sidewalk, we were in a daze. We walked a few paces, blinking our eyes, and then instinctively we both turned around. The priest was still standing on the steps, pale as a ghost and scowling, pale as a ghost, and I gotta get my little uh, exhausted chipmunk ham. Uh, we walked a few paces, blinking our eyes, and instinctively both turned around. The priest was still standing on the steps, pale as a ghost and scowling like the devil himself. He must have been sore as hell. Later, thinking back on it, I really couldn't blame him for it. But at that moment, seeing him with his long skirts and the little skull cap on his cranium, he looked so ridiculous that I burst out laughing. I looked at Fillmore and he began to laugh too. For a full minute, we stood there laughing right into the poor bugger's face. He was so bewildered, I guess, that for a moment, he didn't know what to do. Suddenly, however, he started down the steps on the run, shaking his fist at us as if he were in earnest. When he swung out of the enclosure, he was on the gallop. By this time, some preservative instinct wanted me to get a move on. I grabbed Fillmore by the coat sleeve and started to run. He was saying like an idiot, no, no, I won't run. Come on, I yelled, we better get out of here. That guy is mad clean through. And off we ran, beating it as fast as our legs would carry us. On the way to Dijon, still laughing about the affair, my thoughts reverted to a ludicrous incident of a somewhat similar nature which occur occurred during my brief sojourn in Florida. It was during the celebrated boom. He was talking about the land boom of the, uh, of the 1920s when uh, these, these throngs of clueless morons headed to Florida to make their millions in the land boom uh, is, is what the boom he's talking about. Here it is, just for some backstory. Anyway, uh, it was during the celebrated boom when, like thousands of others, I was caught with my pants down Trying to extricate myself, I got caught along with a friend of mine in the very neck of the bottle, Jacksonville, where we were marooned for about six weeks, was practically in a state of siege. Every bum on earth and a lot of guys who had never been bums before seemed to have drifted into Jacksonville, Florida, the YMCA the Salvation Army, the firehouses and police stations, the hotels, the lodging houses, everything was full up, complete, absolutely, and signs everywhere to that effect. The residents of Jacksonville had become so hardened, it seemed to me, as if they were walking around in coats of mail. It was the old business of food again. The old business, soon to be the new business of food again. Anybody who does not understand what it's going to look like on the streets of Jacksonville, Florida, and everywhere else on this planet, listen up. Listen up. Uncle Henry's trying to tell you something. Uh, it was that old business of food again. Food and a place to sleep. Food was coming up from below in train loads. Oranges and grapefruits and all sorts of juicy edibles. We used to pass by the freight sheds looking for rotten fruit, but even that was scarce. One night, in desperation, I dragged my friend Joe to a synagogue during the service. 
It was a reformed congregation, and the rabbi impressed me rather favorably. The music got me to that piercing lamentation of the Jews. As soon as the service was over, I marched to the rabbi's study and requested an interview with him. He received me decently enough until I made clear my mission. Then he grew absolutely frightened. I had only asked him for a handout on behalf of my friend Joe and myself. You would have thought from the way he looked at us that I had asked to rent the synagogue as a bowling alley. To cap it all, he suddenly asked me point blank if I was a Jew or not. When I answered no, he seemed perfectly outraged. Why, pray tell, had I come to a Jewish pastor for aid? I told him naively that I had always had more faith in the Jews than the Gentiles. <coughs> I said it modestly as if it were one of my peculiar defects. It was the truth, too. But he was not a bit flattered. No siree, he was horrified. To get rid of me, he wrote out a note to the Salvation Army people. That's the place for you to address yourself, he said, and brusquely turned away to tend his flock. The Salvation Army, of course, had nothing to offer us either. <clears throat> if we had had a quarter apiece, we might have rented a mattress on the floor, but we had not a nickel between us. So we went to the park and stretched ourselves out on a bench. It was raining, and so we covered ourselves with newspapers. We weren't there more than a half hour, I imagine, when a cop came along and without a word or warning gave us such a sound fanning that we were up and on our feet in a jiffy and dancing a bit too, though we were not in any mood for dancing. I felt so goddamn sore and miserable, so dejected, so lousy after being whacked over the ass by that half-witted bastard that I could have blown up the Jacksonville City Hall. The next morning, in order to get even with these hospitable sons of bitches, we presented ourselves bright and early at the door of a Catholic priest. This time, I let Joe do the talking. He was Irish, and he had a bit of a brogue. He had very soft blue eyes, too, and he could make them water a bit when he wanted to. A sister in black opened the door for us. She did not ask us inside, however. We were to wait in the vestibule until she went and called for the good father. In a few minutes, he came, the good father, puffing like a locomotive. And what was it we wanted disturbing his lights at that hour of the morning? Something to eat and a place to sleep, we answered innocently. And where did we hail from, the good father wanted to know at once? From New York. From New York? Then you'd better be getting back there as fast as you can, me lads. And without another word, the big, bloated, turnip-faced bastard shoved the door in our face. About an hour later, drifting around helplessly like a couple of drunken schooners, we happened to pass by the rectory again. So help me God if that big, lecherous-looking turnip wasn't backing out of the alley in a limousine. As he, was, as he swung past us, he blew a cloud of smoke into our eyes, as though to say, that's for you. A beautiful limousine it was, with a couple of spare tires in the back, and the good father sitting at the wheel with a big cigar in his mouth. It must have been a Corona Corona, so fat and luscious it was. Sitting pretty he was, 
and no two ways about it. I couldn't see whether he had skirts on or not. I could only see the gravy trickling from his lips and the big cigar with that 50 cent aroma. Getting, getting back to France. All the way to Dijon, I got to reminiscing about the past. I thought of all the things I might have said and done, which I had not said or done in the bitter, humiliating moments when just to ask for a crust of bread is to make yourself less than a worm. Stone sober as I was, I was still smarting from those old insults and injuries. I could still feel that whack over the ass which that cop gave me in the park. Though that was a mere bagatelle, a little dancing lesson, you might say. All over the United States I wandered, and into Canada and Mexico. The same story everywhere. If you want bread, you've got to get in harness, get in lockstep. Over all the earth is a gray desert, a carpet of steel and cement. Production! More nuts and bolts, more barbed wire, more dog biscuits, more lawnmowers, more ball bearings, more high explosives, more tanks, more poison gas, more soap, more toothpaste, more newspapers, more education, more churches, more libraries, more museums. Forward, time presses. <coughs> the embryo is pushing through the neck of the womb and there's not even a gob of spit to ease the passage. A dry, strangulating birth, not a wail, not a chirp. Salute of 21 guns bombinating from the rectum. Quote, I, I wear my hat as I please, indoor or out, said Walt, assuming Walt Whitman, as I assume he's talking about, I wear my hat as I please, indoor, indoors or out. Well, that was a time when you could still get a hat to fit your head. But time passes. To get a hat that fits now, you have to walk to the electric chair. They give you a skull cap, a tight fit, but no matter, it fits. You have to be in a strange country like France, walking the meridian that separates the hemispheres between life and death to know what incalculable vistas yawn ahead in 1934. The body electric, the democratic soul, flood tide. Holy mother of God, what does this crap mean? The earth is parched and cracked. Men and women come together like broods of vultures over a stinking carcass to mate and fly apart again. Vultures who drop from the clouds like heavy stones. Talons and beak, that's what we are. A huge intestinal apparatus with a nose for dead meat. Forward, forward, without pity, without compassion, without love, without forgiveness. Ask no quarter and give none. More battleships, more poison gas, more high explosives, more genococci, more streptococci, more bombing machines, more and more of it until the whole fucking works is blown to smithereens and the earth with it. Thank you, Henry Miller, Tropic of Cancer. Amen, brother. 
A the fuck man, brother. And you wonder why Tropic of Cancer was banned by these motherfuckers. No, he said the word cunt. Honey, honey, he said the word cunt. He talked about he, he, he talked about his big dick. Honey, we can't let the kids read about about cunts. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes, little dog. Are you upset? I gotta go give the little dog some food because he's worked up a big appetite looking for chippies. Bye, guys. Get out there and enjoy it while you can, folks. We're fucked. We're fucked. Dance on the rim of the crater while you still can.